All right, I think we'll get going. Well, first, let me say thanks for uh, thanks for coming in today. We appreciate it. Uh, if you just walked in or haven't uh, gotten any food yet, there's there's lunch in the back and refreshments. So either now or during the presentation, feel free to help yourself. Uh, a few sort of housekeeping matters. First, Silicon Prairie News, thanks a lot for sharing your space with us. Uh, very much appreciated. Let me do a few introductions. Uh, I'm Dan McMahon. I'm a business attorney at Coley Jetson uh, with a focus on startup work and venture capital work. On my immediate right is Bart Dillashaw, who uh, is the newest member of the Coley Jetson team. Bart sp has spent a majority of his career uh, at a law firm in Silicon Valley as a startup attorney. Moved to Nebraska a couple years ago, um, has been active in the startup space, is the president of Nebraska Angel, mm -hmm. and we were very excited to, to hire him and, and bring him on board uh, earlier this month. And uh, I think the startup community here will benefit greatly from having him uh, focusing on it full time, so uh, thrilled to have him. Uh, awesome. At the end here is Michael Weta, who's a principal at Dundee Venture Capital. Uh, as most of you probably know, that's a, a venture capital investment firm here in town. The office just down the hallway here. Um, focus on, on fairly early stage investments uh, with a focus in e-commerce uh, companies. So. Uh, next, just a quick overview of our group. Uh, this event is put on by a group called Mastercraft Advisors, which uh, Coley Jess is a part of. It's a group of service provider firms um, that we're, lo we're looking for a way to sort of help contribute and, uh, to the continued growth of the startup space here. and, and uh, bring sort of an educational component to it, I guess. And we do that in, in two ways. One, we have these lunch and learns uh, twice a month, same time, same place. Uh, you can go on our website for a list of dates and topics. And if there's anything you want us to present on, please let us know. Uh, we also hold office hours uh, here in the Mastercraft building. Uh, someone's here every day and then by appointment on Friday. And our time is free just to uh, consult with people and you know help you think through issues you have or identify issues you don't know you have yet, you know, whatever uh, you may want. So take advantage of that. Now that again, we're just you know, you know, sort of trying to, to, to add to the growth and, and sort of bridge that gap between service providers and startups and, and add to that conversation. So then lastly, the format today is sort of a hybrid, I guess, between a, a presentation. I'll present on a few sort of topics and frame the issue and then pose questions to our panel of experts over here. So given the format, uh, feel free to weigh in uh, throughout. Um, if you have a question on the topic we're talking about. Otherwise, uh, we'll reserve some time at the end for, for sort of general Q&A. So, with that said, I'm gonna give you a little context and, and background. Um, I feel like in the venture capital financing, the term sheet has sort of come to this elevated status where people talk about it a lot. Everyone tries to get to the, the signed up term sheet. There's a ton of commentary out there on sort of what are market terms, what should the terms be for these kind of deals, and sort of trying to standardize that. So it's a topic that gets a lot of conversation, um, and it's sort of evolved. You know, I think gone are the days for the most part of sort of a handshake deal or a back of the napkin deal, um, and it's evolved into this five, ten page, you know, document that's got lawyers' handprints all over it, and and you know, you spend a fair amount of time negotiating it back and forth, and. You know, that's sort of the downside, I guess, but the, the upside, which I think overall has been a good thing, is, um, you know, a good term sheet is your blueprint and roadmap for the entire relationship and the entire deal. And, you know, addressing the tough issues and flushing everything out at a very early stage in a deal is huge, a, a huge time and cost saver, both for the business people and the attorneys and cutting down costs. So. Again, I think it's important, um, and I think it's been a, generally a good thing uh, that it's become kind of a, uh, you know, more of a process than maybe it used to be. And again, just sort of giving you a little bit of context and sort of where the term sheet fits into the fundraising process as a whole. You know, these are sort of the typical steps of a, of a you know, founder or startup trying to get to the fundraise or the term sheet process. And I, you know, in my experience, the most important one is sort of landing that lead investor. You know, you may be talking to friends and family or angel groups or VCs or other investors and, you know, everyone's sort of interested, but it can kind of be like herding cats a little bit. So if you can get that lead investor to, to really take the reins on, you know, what's the pricing, what are the terms, um, leading the diligence, drafting the deal documents, you know, then your other investors can sort of follow suit. Um, and so, 
you know, Bart, during this stage, you know, the founders are out there trying to raise money. Um, you know, what sort of advice would you have or what do you recommend that they generally prepare? Would that be you know, a full offering document, just a slide deck? Should they propose their own term sheet? You know, sort of what do you recommend and what do you see um, with the angels? You know, you see a lot of groups coming in. Sort of what, a, what sort of best practice there? Yeah, so I, I think typically when, uh, when someone gets first introduced into a deal, they're, uh, you know, there may be what the, the, you know, the elevator pitch that you get, which is sort of the 30 seconds, let me give you just enough information so that you ask for a little bit more. Um, and, uh, and it's definitely worthwhile to practice and be able to very clearly articulate what it is that your company can do in 30 seconds. Um, because a lot of times, uh, yeah, that's all the attention you ever kind of get. Now, the only, you know, the only goal of that 30 seconds should be to get someone interested enough that they ask for a little bit more information. Um, and, uh, and so you ought to be able to at least do that. Then, then the, the main document that I think we see and certainly everything that comes before the angels, is gonna be a, a slide deck presentation. We don't see that many um, PPMs. Um, every once in a while you'll see that. And for those who aren't familiar with it, a PPM is like a, you know, a 50 to 100 page disclosure document. It's very heavily laden with legalese. It's got a lot of information in it, uh, which is great, but you know, if, you know, if you're someone like Michael, you probably see 100 of these a week and you're not gonna read this much information. You want something that's a lot more concise, that's gonna tell the story mm -hmm. instantaneously. 15, 16 slides is probably about the, the right number and uh, it ought to tell a concise investment story that's kind of, um, you know, it's going to describe your company, describe the market, uh, describe why, why investors would be interested, which probably means why they're going to make a lot of money if they give you some, and, uh, and a little bit about the, the project team. And, uh, and so that's really where I see entrepreneurs spending the, the bulk of their time and effort trying to get a good pitch deck. And, I think people underestimate how hard it is to, to put together a concise story that really brings all these pieces mm -hmm. together. Um, yeah. So yeah, Michael, related yeah. to that, yeah. you know, what do you look for? I mean, for us in that initial meeting, it's, it's really clarity of purpose. It's, it's why are you here? I mean, are you here simply to you know, discuss your ideas and get some advice about you know, where to go, or are you looking for money? And just setting that up right away, everybody's on the same page, what are we here, what's the purpose of the meeting, is huge. And then going off the clarity piece really is you really get into the idea it's it's the clarity of the problem what is the problem in the market that you're trying to solve and what is your solution and really hammering home why it's an issue and why your why your problem why it's why it's an issue and kind of why your solution is is viable um, and then going down there's a couple of other things which is <clears throat> really customer validation who is a human being that you've talked to that's a potential customer that's interested in this you know sitting in your basement going through building a product and going through spreadsheets of how well this will scale and how much you can sell it for is great, but actually getting out of the building and talking to somebody and saying, yes, I will be your first customer. This is, this is a real problem for me. This is how much I'm willing to pay is, is huge. Um, and then lastly is just in that initial meeting, it's only about an hour, um, it's just really showing your deep understanding of the marketplace and the unit economics of the business. This is how much it costs to develop it. This is how much I'm going to sell it for. These are my marketing costs. It doesn't need to be detailed. We don't need to see what the projections are in 2017. But just having a general understanding of what the unit economics are and that a reasonable sense that this is really going to be a scalable business um, is a great start in that first meeting. How do you pivot from that? Like I mentioned, you know, landing that lead investor is, is huge to sort of rein in the whole process in. So how do you pivot from a successful pitch, the, the investor's interested, I mean, is it, you know, if you guys like the people and the idea, is it time to do a term sheet or is there, you know, a fair amount of diligence that would go into to even signing up a term sheet or how do you sort of rein that in, either, either of you, just in your experience? I mean, for us, the way we operate is we really operate on speed. So if, if the initial pitch just knocks us out of the park, it's, it's right in our bread basket in terms of the fundraise size, the markets you're playing in. Um, you're in technology, you're in, in web services, you know, we'll send you a term sheet later that day. And for us, that just gets everybody on the same page in terms of it forces the conversations around value and expectation. And so if we can get pretty close on what the value should be, what the raise amount will be, the sources of funds, that gives us a signal for let's really dig in and understand these guys. Um, just for us, you know, 
we only have so much time. Entrepreneurs only have so much time. The last thing we want to do is both of us dance around and try and validate this idea for weeks and then come back to, oh, well, I thought this was a $10 million valuation. Well, we think it's a million, and we've just wasted weeks on it. So for us, we err on getting a term sheet out to force those conversations up front and just um, really understand whether or not this is a, a deal that's going to work. Yeah, and uh, for the angels, we're, we're probably not as quick to deliver a term sheet. We'll get into a little bit more of the diligence first and try to figure things out. Um, but it's almost a dual process. Um, you know, some, we're not going to necessarily wait till the diligence is completely done before you get a term sheet. But somewhere along the way, we'll have learned enough information that we feel comfortable coming forward with a term sheet. I, I, in, in going back to another point that you mentioned, sort of should an entrepreneur show up with their own term sheet ahead of time? Um, I'll be curious to get your thoughts on this as well. My, um, my general thoughts are that you should probably have something in mind. I mean, you need to have, one, you need to have at least gotten to the point where you've articulated what it is that you want out of the situation and be in a position where you can say, yes, I want $1 million and I'm willing to give up 20, 30, 40, 80% of my company, whatever the number's gonna be. You know, from there, I wouldn't get uh, too bogged down in what the details are, because frankly, that's just an open, opening bid and right. you know, Michael's probably gonna say, that's right. cute, here's my term sheet. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then it opens it up. But you should have at least thought down that road, um, partially because you need to be prepared mm -hmm. as soon as you get a term sheet from him to respond and say, a million dollars yeah. isn't the right valuation. Ten million is, and here's why. And here's my comparables, and here's you know my market validation. And did you know that I'm actually making a million dollars a year right now? You know, you need to be prepared ahead of time to start having that conversation because you know once the term sheet happens, things are going to start moving really, really quick. And if you're not on the ball, you're not going to be able to respond. Right. Yeah. Certainly, understanding what what terms you're looking for and what those terms mean is important. I certainly wouldn't go to the expense of, of hiring a lawyer yeah. to develop your own term sheet to present to the yeah. VC. I agree with that. Ninety-nine percent of the time, you're going to go off the VC's term sheet. Um, so, yeah, know your terms, but I wouldn't come in with the deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how fun. Mm -hmm. Again, just sort of, where does this fit into the overall process? You know, the fun's just beginning when the term sheet's signed. Unfortunately, that's not the end of things. Now, the term sheet's generally non-binding. Again, just more of a roadmap to where you want to get, and usually it. It sort of unleashes the hounds to, to do diligence, to start, you know, let the lawyers start drafting the deal documents and negotiate the full deal. Um, as Bart said, sometimes those go hand in hand, just depending on sort of what stage in the process the term sheet gets signed up. Um, and this process can take, you know, I mean, again, if it's, a, if it's a very thorough term sheet and everyone's on the same page, you know, anymore, I mean, deal documents could be signed up in a week or so and be closed. Uh, you know, sometimes, depending on how much the diligence, diligence you know, how much there is there, it could take you know a month or so. I don't know sort of general time frame that you guys see if that's about right. Or... Yeah, I've seen deals take six months um, just because people get bogged down in some issue. Most of the time, when that happens, it's because there's some delay. Uh, it's something along the lines of, well, you told me you had a contract in hand from Walmart to buy two million dollars a year doesn't look like that's actually quite been signed yet. Let's wait and see how that plays out. And that'll sometimes delay the process. But um, On that point, what are some things you see in diligence um, you know, that, that do delay deals, maybe even sometimes kill deals? You know, things that maybe the company, if they had thought about it you know, before they went to market or you know, right when they were formed or whatever, could have cleaned up. So you know, sort of common mistakes maybe you see um, that get uncovered during the diligence right. process. I mean, for us, it's a lot of exaggeration. So they have more customer traction. They, they present initially, they, it seems to us they have more customer traction than what they, they, it, they, now, they really do have, or the product isn't quali quite as developed, um, that kind of stuff. And then there's other stuff that's just, it's kind of those skeleton things that they don't bring out until and you're in the middle of diligence. It's, oh, we have a dollar loan that you know, needs to be repaid in a couple months. Or, you know, one of the guys that started with us who really kind of built yeah. half the code, he's in New Zealand now. We don't really, can't get a hold of him and we're not in good terms. Or, yeah, or we kind of had a fight. Um, he's kind of suing us. <laughs> we may not own our core IP. Okay. But other than that, everything's really, um, really in good shape. And the worst, and it's embarrassing for us too, is yeah. you do a Google search and 
there's three companies that are doing exactly the same thing you did or, or trying to do, and they've already raised $3 million. Right. And it's just like, well, wait a second, what? <laughs> Gonna work. Those are, I think, those are the biggest things. It's just, you know, being just too aggressive in what, how far you think you are down the path, and then just those issues that it's all going to come up. So, and hopefully, it comes up in the due diligence process. The worst thing is it comes up after the due diligence process. You've already made the investment. So, if there's funny things that you know it could be issues, just, just bring them out because they're going to come out at some point. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, nothing will kill a deal quicker than if there's any hint of uh, certainly dishonesty, but I mean, it's almost even unprofessionalism. Yes. Um, a, a huge part of investing in these startup companies is investing in the team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're really, when it comes down to it, you know, there's an idea and, you know, maybe a good market, but you know, the bet that you are making is that this team that is sitting in front of you is going to be able to crack this code and get it done. And if at any point along the way you lose faith in them, then that's going to kill a deal. Mm -hmm. And that could come out in a lot of different ways. One is if it's a consistent pattern of sort of exaggerating ideas, a consistent pattern of not really being able to address real facts as mm -hmm. they come before you, um, you know, that'll kind of kill a deal. But I'd say from a legal diligence standpoint, you, know, you guys touched on it a little bit again. Make sure you own your intellectual property, um, especially if you're in you know, the, the type of companies we're talking about. I mean, that's kind of the key. And then and get your ownership right. Again, if you have somebody that may or may not own half your company or half your IP, I mean, huge red flags and, and certainly enough to kill a deal. So, um, you know, otherwise, you know, there's not a ton of diligence, I'd say, on the legal side in, in a lot of sort of the early stage startup companies. But those are your sort of two big ones to make sure you get right. Yeah, and, and I will say also, the, in terms of delays and cost, if it's been, well, of course putting my lawyer hat on, but if it's, you know, if it's been a real messy startup, you know, you maybe started late, you have a lot of sort of employees with options that have never been you know, papered, you have a bunch of loans, you have a bunch of contracts, there's just been no formality to anything. Um, which happens a lot because you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to code and you're trying to make sales. But if you lose track of all of that, it can be really messy and it can be really expensive to clean up because Michael's not going to write you a check until all of it's done. And, uh, and so it's just, you're doing yourself a lot more favors if you just keep track of that as you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll move on to some of the actual sort of terms in a term sheet. Um, you know, I, we generally sort of look at the term sheet in, in sort of three buckets in terms of structure that in sort of order of importance here too. The first is economics. You know, that touches things along the investors, you know, the price they're paying and, and anything that sort of touches their ownership. Um, control, again, just goes to what sort of role they'll have in sort of the decision making of the company on various topics. Then risk allocation, somewhat of a catch-all, you know, just sort of all the other sort of various rights and, and restrictions you'll negotiate um, into a term sheet. You know, we could spend hours, you know, going through all the terms that hit, hit each of these. You know, this lists some of the more important ones. Um, you know, again, ton of commentary out there in terms of, you know, what's market, what are the issues to be concerned of. Um, and slide later on kind of tells you where to go for some of that, and we're always available for that. So I don't think we'll dive in too deep on, on each particular issue. Um, instead, we'll just sort of walk through each of these buckets and, and touch on sort of the one or two, um, you know, kind of main issues we see. and. and sort of have that issues to be aware of, so. I, I will sort of expand on yeah. some of the, you know, some of the issues, just to kind of, you know, you have two parties involved. You have an investor and you have the company and they each have some, a lot of similar interests and they have some that are different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really what the term sheet is, is you know, trying to figure out ways to manage mm -hmm. those interests versus each other. So economics is pretty straightforward, right? Investors want the return on their investment. and. You know, there's a lot of different ways to structure that, and you know, it's more than just buy at one price and sell for another. There's you know, downside protections, right. and what if this happens? So that's a lot of those buckets. That's what it gets filled in. The control stuff is also, you know, it is a different one, and it's in a slightly different category because most of these investments, the, the investors are taking a minority position. Um, you know, with all, if it were just the sort of normal rule of majority rules. The investors would have no control over the company. They, you know, they, they could be, you know, effectively pushed out. They could be diluted. Uh, they could have all of their rights dissolved. If the company can just act without really considering too much, 
their interests. So most of these control uh, terms really are sort of minority protections. They're there to make sure that the investor you know, doesn't get screwed by the, minor, by the majority um, for the most part. And, and, and that's really kind of the direction that most of those terms are coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, and then risk allocation is just, okay, you know, if this goes wrong, who's liable for that? Is it me or is it for you? Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's helpful. So. Thank you. So the first sort of bucket, and again, that gets the most attention, certainly, you know, leading up to, to whether there's a deal or not is, is the economics. Um, you know, the number one issue you've got to talk about, we've already touched on a little bit, is you know, sort of what's the valuation, what are we buying in at? Um, you'll hear the term pre-money value, which is just what it is, you know, what, what the investors think the company's worth uh, before they put the money in, and you know, that's sort of, you know, I'd say, sort of the threshold issue to whether or not you have a deal, um, and, and that's sort of a peg number that a lot of other things kind of turn on. Um, but one sort of word of caution, I mean, there's a whole lot of other terms, Bart touched on a couple, that impact it. So it's not so straightforward. You know, the example we have here, uh, you know, <coughs> too closely at it, but the, you know, the investor essentially is buying, you know, 20% of the company um, in this investment. But the investor is also, which is very common, saying, hey, you know, we want to set aside a certain percentage of the company to give to, uh, you know, an option pool or a stock plan to attract and retain key, em key employees. Well, that's going to come out of the founder's share, not the investor's share. Um, so in this example, you sell 20% of your company to the investor, but as part of that deal, you've also created a 15% employee pool. Well, so at the end of the day, the founder doesn't own 80% of the company. He's, you know, he's, he or she's down to 65%. So there's provisions like that um, that, again, go to the economics of it, affect ownership, um, and are sort of beyond just the sort of valuation of the company. Um, you know, one question we get a lot is, you know, how much should I raise? And some of that depends on what round you're in or whatever. Um, but Bart and I were talking about that. I don't know, you know, what do you generally advise? Or sort of how much should a company try to raise in a given round? And does that sort of define the round or, you know? Yeah, and there's obviously a, a lot of different schools of thought on this. Um, sort of the conventional wisdom is, you know, raise about 12 to 18 months of capital, which should be enough to get you through whatever the next major milestones facing your company. And hopefully after that, even if you still need more money after that, you've gotten such a proof of concept, you know, proof, you, you de-risk it from a technology uh, perspective that you're going to get a boost in valuation. Um, and, and so you don't necessarily want to raise the full chunk of money right off the bat because you know, your valuation is going to be really, really small. So let's say you need $10 million to fully execute on your plan. You can't raise that on day one because people are going to say, well, you, you haven't done anything. You don't have a market. You don't have uh, a product yet. Um, I need, in order to make this work, I need 95% of your company. Um, so instead, what you say is, all right, I'll, I'll raise $1 million now. Um, I'll sell 20% of my company. Uh, and then with that $1 million, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go get a million dollars in sales. And now I've proved that my product works and my company's worth a lot more. So now I'm gonna go raise another five million and sell another 20% of my company. But you, know, you're, you, know, you wind up with a, a much larger percentage of the company. So mm -hmm. the conventional wisdom is raise enough to get you through that next big valuation milestone. Um, and then, but there's definitely an overlay of mm -hmm. if you can get money now, take as much as you can, because it may not be there next week, um, you know, so I... Right, no, I think that's a general rule we use, is we want the, the founders at least to have 12 months of capital to get that the next milestone and get a proof of concept. Um, and really, you know, depending on the, depending on the firm, it's, it's to, to, get to, the, to get to the next round. Um, so 12 to 18 months is generally about right. Mm -hmm. In terms of valuation, oh, go ahead. What, what's your guys' perspective on just people who think their company is worth way more than what it is? And, uh, you know, from part of your perspective, man, I'm like, I'm curious as to how you temper expectations and bridge that. I think it's two things. One, I mean, the biggest thing is, is just working with the founders to realize that if, if you raise today at tomorrow's valuation, um, you have to execute during that round because you need a much bigger valuation when you go raise money again. So, you know, the idea is, is for us, you know, generally, you know, if you raise it at a $3 million valuation, you need to have a 10, 12, $15 million valuation your next round to raise money. 
So if you raise a $10 million valuation today, that means you got to be a $30 million valuation on the next raise. So it's just trying to help them work through that if you raise too much at too high valuation now, that might be the only capital you can raise. Um, and then the other thing is you just you, know, you just work through and just say, hey, listen, you know, based on what we've seen, comps, you know, this is just way out of market. Now, if you can get somebody to, to you know, give you money at that valuation, you more power to you. But for us, the way we look at it, here's what we're looking at. This is this is our valuation. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I agree with that. I mean, some of it is just market dynamics. Go out there and raise money at the highest valuation you can get, and you know. You can get stuck. Some fast. of it's price, right? You know, you're a great company, but I'm not going to invest at this valuation. Yeah. So. What you really want to avoid is, is that down round where you raise, you know, more money at the same valuation you raised on the previous one. Because in that case, the investors generally have pretty good downside protection, and the founder, it's really coming out of their, their equity. And at that point, the next investor is like, do I really want to invest in a guy who not only has 20% upside in their company because they've just given up all their equity? During this round, so it's 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 meeting all those expectations. Um, I keep hearing you know, the magic term scalability, mm -hmm. and that, that really really pumps up evaluation, which would make sense. But um, you know, what's your thoughts on that in terms of, for instance, something that's a, a software product that can be duplicated again and again and again right. immediately? Right. Uh, as opposed to right. Well, for us, we're really looking at, I mean, if you want a big valuation, it's that you've proven the business model that it works. It's like we all know that software is highly scalable. So, you know, if you can sell something for 10000 it only costs $1,000 to market it. And, you know, it's a huge market. You're going to get a big valuation if you can prove that it really only costs 1000 bucks to move it through. You know, if you walk in with. You know, here's my unit economics. Like that looks great. You know, here's a million, two million dollar valuation. Go prove that, and then you know, down the road, it's, it's the ten million, fifteen million dollar valuation. But until you've proven that model actually works, it's pretty difficult. And, and, and some of that just goes to the, the nature of sort of investing at this level. Uh, investors are looking for not a, you know, they're not looking to get a twenty percent return on their investment. They're looking to get multiple. thousand times their investment, right? So just the, the nature of that means you have to have a product that is you know, can be kind of game changing uh -huh. uh, or at least it's gonna be highly profitable. So if it's you know if it's a bricks and mortar company that's gonna be high cash <coughs> expenditures, you know, you're you know as an investor you're looking at it saying, okay this is great, but you know, I'm getting a fifteen percent sort of return on assets, best case scenario, and by the way you're going to need another $100 million to get this thing to grow. So like, just the business economics don't work out so that I'm even you know, kind of be able to <coughs> laugh myself to sleep at night saying that I'm going to get 10, 30 times return on this specific investment. So part of that is, is just inherent to this, this asset class uh, and why scalability is so important. So we're moving to the next bucket of, of control. Um, you know, like Bart mentioned, I mean, I, you know, the VC is a minority investor, so without sort of negotiated rights, um, you know, they don't have a right to sort of make decisions, veto um, you know, uh, decisions the company's doing. So there's two sort of ways they address that. One is, is to get a board seat or sometimes just a board observer seat. Again, they don't usually control the board, but it gives them a chance to sort of have their voice heard being on business decisions. The other one, which is a little more powerful, are, are protective provisions or sort of veto rights, which essentially say, you know, the company can't do X, Y, and Z without the approval um, of the investors. And I usually lump those into sort of two categories. One are sort of corporate actions, so out of, out of ordinary course of business stuff. Selling the business, going public, another round of financing, um, and sort of big company decisions like that. Uh, the other bucket are sort of business decisions. So. Hiring, firing employees, um, borrowing money, um, things like that. It, it's a tough balance, uh, I think, to walk because again, the VC needs some protections. Uh, they've made a sizable investment; they want some say on things. But at the same time, I think in order for the company to be successful and grow, and in fact, for the VC to uh, you know be attractive to, to new uh, portfolio companies, you know, the, 
founders need to feel like they're empowered to run the business and they're not sort of you know, looking over the shoulder every time they're making a decision or sort of big brother looking over them. So, I don't know if you guys can speak both from the founder's perspective and from the VC. I mean, how do you, how do you strike that balance? Um, you know, and, and one other element to add to it, which I, I think a lot of people don't think about, is kind of interesting. You know, Dundee's making an investment you know, in your company and, and you get along great with Michael. Uh, and he gives you a long list of things that you know, his approval, you know, the company's approval is needed for it. You may feel comfortable with that because you like Michael and he says, hey, you know, we'll rubber stamp those. This is just a, a risk allocation thing. Uh, well, who knows if Michael will be there in three years? Uh, <laughs> 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 I, 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 I know. Might know. <laughs> <laughs> but when that decision has to be made, you, know, you don't know who that, that person is on the other end. So, Again, it's, a, it's kind of a tough conversation to have and a tough balance to, to walk early, but, um, you know, I mean, so either you speak to that. We invest in entrepreneurs and people. It's their babies. They're the domain experts. They run the business day to day. So, by no means, you know, we want to show up every day and say, okay, what are you, what are you guys working on today? Um, so, for us, it's, it's having some information rights to get reporting of activity, how things are going against goals, how things are going against goals. You know, what's your cash position, what's your burn rate, just understanding how the business is performing. So for us, it's, it's really getting the And then when you get into more of the protective provisions, is we want a voice during major strategic changes in the business. So if you were selling shoes, and now you're going to sell cameras, we want to talk about that. You know, if you're really changing what the business is, we want to talk about that. If you, you know, you're hiring somebody with a $250,000 salary, yeah, we need to we need to talk about this in the startup environment. Um, if you're going to go out and try and raise money, take out a big loan, again, we want to have a seat at the table. But having said that, the day to day stuff, executing the strategy, you know, we want to you know, at least have a voice and some guidance and that kind of stuff. But in terms of the day to day management business, who you're going to hire, the decisions you're going to make, that's all that. Um, but the big decisions, we need to have some, at least, at least some say. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. It's definitely an area of tension between entrepreneurs and investors. Um, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, this is their baby, they want to be able to run it. Uh, but, you know, should you be allowed to go out and write a million dollar check, you know, without, you know, <coughs> your investor? I mean, that's a, you know, that's a question that comes up. And it, maybe it, you know, the entrepreneur may say, look, I firmly believe that this is in the best interest of the company. But uh, Michael's saying, I'm looking at your financials, and it's not. And it's my money, so you can't do it. And that, that's a tension that plays out. So uh, you know, it is important to make sure that you do have a good relationship with your investors, um, that you walk through these. And it's like that's another one of the good things about term sheets is that you really start to get a sense of what the working guide is going to be like. Because this is not a one moment in time relationship. It is something that goes for a, a good investor is valuable because they're going to be able to give you advice, connections. They will probably line up your next round of financing for you. Um, and so you want that good relationship in there. And at the same point, if it's a bad relationship, they've got a lot of control of your over your company, whether you like it or not. You know, if you've got a nasty relationship with your investor, that's going to cause problems with us down the line. So um, this is just an important area to work for to make sure that all parties are skip over this next one so we get to the, the end. The risk allocation bucket again covers a lot of stuff and I think the, the most important one of those is, is on this next slide which we sort of call founders issues. Um, again, I, this speaking of sort of tension and sort of emotionally charged issues, I think this is, is probably the number one. Um, and this you know, generally sort of covers what are the expectations of the founder in terms of you know, time spent on the business, can they have other business activities, can they be fired, um, or are they sort of entrenched in their role? Um, and then also, you know, what are the consequences of that? And that ties into the vesting. You know, usually if any of those things happen, um, you know, the founder forfeits sort of his unvested share. So, um, you know, it's a, a difficult conversation to have. And I think sometimes the, the chips are stacked a little bit against the founder because you know, they got to look out for their rights, but you're trying to sign up the term sheet, you're trying to raise money. Um, you gotta look out for your rights, but at the same time, the more you push on these issues, you know, are you raising a red flag for the VC? Um, 
you see, I mean, this guy's already trying to go, you know, negotiate his exit uh, from the company, and you know, trying to do this, that, or the other. So, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, just kind of speak generally on how those conversations go. Um, you know, what sort of founder can do without maybe even the VC is impression that he's, he's uh, not committed to the company. Sort of what's reasonable in market in this space. I mean, for us, investing is, is an absolute <coughs> necessity. I mean, so you're up, initially, you know, you're all around the table, we're all friends, and I'm committed to this business, and I'm going to be here until the end. It's like, fantastic. So, you know, just represent that. So, so let's, let's get on an investing schedule. And really what that prevents for us is we're investing in that entrepreneur. And if that entrepreneur is out there, then we have serious difficulties getting any sort of exit out of this business. And so we just need the entrepreneur to, to sign up and stand up and say, yes, I'm, I'm going to be here um, um, for that. And so for us, and we'll work around, you know, if, if they're, you know, if they put considerable time and energy and funding into the company, we'll give them some credit on the vesting as well. Um, but typically what we see, you know, there's this, this, this fear that, you know, the VCs, these evil VCs are, you know, right before the big cliff where I'm going to invest, you know, a big portion of my, of my equity, um, the, the VC is just going to walk in and fire you and have this new CEO. I and mean, it's, it's just not the case. I mean, we, we're investing in the entrepreneur, um, you know, we don't, and uh, on top of that, just from a reputation perspective, I mean, we're in Omaha. Like, if we did that one time, we would right. never make another <laughs> investment in the Midwest. Like, it's, it's just not possible. Um, so for us, it's, it's just friendly, hey, you just, just represent you're going to be here for a couple of years. Um, and certainly in an instance where there's co-founders, there's multiple co-founders, um, you know, we see it every week where you'll see a cap table and it's, who's Jim Williams? Oh, he was here at the beginning and he is disinterested and left and he has 33% of the company. You know, he's just not there day to day, not doing anything. And if there's ever an event, he's going to have all the upside that the founders who are there every day are going to have. So it's really protection for the entrepreneurs and co-founders. To touch on that to point, you know, we, we yeah. recommend certainly if you, you know, even yeah. at the formation of the company, if you have multiple co-founders, we, we certainly recommend at least having that conversation and putting an investing schedule in just amongst yourselves uh, before you even think of raising money for that very reason. I mean, you all put in sweat equity, you're about to go have a successful round. One of them gets a higher paying corporate job, leaves, gets the salary and the ownership. So, um, and it has added benefits sometimes, which, which Michael touched on. You know, if you put in a, a, a reasonable vesting schedule at the start, and by the time you're raising money, maybe you're a third vested in that schedule. You know, sometimes the VC may just leave that in and sort of give you credit for time served. So there's some benefits there too on, on kind of jump starting that. Do so, um, you ever see that as a conflict? Um, no, because most of the time in, in an exit situation, either the best thing is just going to continue um, or you, there's sometimes you can negotiate for a term that says, look, if I get fired right before Microsoft comes in and you know, buys everything or I get fired right after Microsoft comes in and buys my, uh, buys my company, then my shares will accelerate and they'll vest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you'll, you'll hear either sort of single trigger or dual trigger acceleration or sort of the, the two terms that you hear about it about. Um, single trigger means if I get acquired, all my shares vest. Double trigger means if I get fired right after I get acquired, then all my shares will vest. And, and that's actually far more common because, um, you know, if Microsoft comes in and buys your company, Chances are they probably want you to stick around for at least a little while to help integrate it, help you know migrate it over, and and so they want you to be motivated to stick around. And then you know, once I'm done with you, I can fire you, and you'll walk off with your shares, and I'm happy, and you're happy. Um, but uh, but I don't want to have to, yeah. You know, you're making twenty million dollars off of this deal, and great. Now you're not that excited to show up to work every day and help me integrate because you want to go off and fly your private jet. Um, and, we, and that, that scenario happens, and um, and so then what will happen is Microsoft will say, all right, well, now we got to pay them an extra $5 million to uh, to stick around or something, and then the investors are mad because that typically comes out of their return. Um, so, you know, there are ways to sort of deal with that scenario that, uh, that you know, they come up so that it's not a conflict of interest or at least, you know, at the outset, everyone is uh, agreeable with how it should break down. Just generally, just had a couple sort of uh, canned questions for, you know, sort of recap it and, and kind 
kind of look back on things. And so one is, what are your sort of top three most important terms uh, that you see, either individually or, or just you know, your, your impression of, of founders, what are the top three terms they should care about? And same question to Michael for VCs. Yeah, I, I'd say for founders, um, you know, price is obviously the most important. And then um, the protective provisions is, uh, is really the thing to pay attention to. Make sure, and it's not really so much that there is a right answer, it's make sure you are comfortable with the uh, structure that's been set up because if you find yourself that you're, it's making you frustrated and it's something that you're not comfortable with, you're gonna be unhappy, eventually it's gonna start to piss you off, that's gonna make you angry at your investors, and then you go down this trail where you know, it's not a warm, happy, fuzzy relationship, and so let's just get that out of the um, out of the way early on because and I think even Michael, you'd say mm -hmm. I, I want this to be a good relationship yeah. that everyone's happy with. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I uh, you know, founder vesting is obviously a big one as well. So, you know, if you're a founder, I pay attention to it. I think founder vesting is very very reasonable, and I think especially with co-founders, it's something to be had, but. You know, it's also okay to ask and say, look, I've been working at this company for five years. I want at least 20% of my shares vested up front. So it's another term to, um, you know, to pay attention to. Um, Any of those terms do you consider just non-negotiable? I mean, you know, you'd advise a founder to kill a deal over them and went and walk away. No, everything's, everything is at the right price. All terms are on the table. <laughs> I mean, period. And, and, that's, and, and that's, that's actually a really important thing. You know, you see a term sheet and it's nine pages of everything else, but look, valuation is, trumps all other terms. If someone is gonna give you a, just a out of this world valuation and say, yeah, here's $10 million, I want 1% of your company, but you have to be fully, you know, you have to be fully vested and, you know, you can't go to the bathroom without getting my permission and I need a parking spot and you have to rename the company. Take listen. take a million listen. dollars for <laughs> right. for one percent. You know, it's yeah. just um, you know valuation trumps all others. Yeah, I mean for us, I mean valuation it gets there too. But you know, there's softer stuff too, and just validating that the, the founder is in this to scale. This isn't a lifestyle business. We're going to be at ten million dollars in revenue in a few years, um, and that it's not it's not a, a corporate job. You know, we're not into you know replacing your corporate salary and benefits. It's making sure that the Founder is really going to go after this, so probably taking a pay cut um, and all that fun stuff. But the rest of the stuff, it's important. But again, you know, there, there's give and take. You know, depending on the deal and the price and what the market is, um, you know, you, you flex. I mean, if, if it's if you like the team and you're a good valuation, um, you're going to find a way to get the deal done. <laughs> Last question for me. Um, Bar, I thought it'd be interesting if you kind of speak generally. Again, you spent a, a fair amount of time in uh, Silicon Valley at Wilson Sonsini. If you guys don't know, law firms, it's sort of you know, the law firm in this space. It's, it sets the trends for sort of what market terms are. Um, and a lot of people look to the, the sort of content they produce to kind of see what's market. So speak generally, maybe differences you've seen uh, between the, the valley and the prairie, if you will, in terms yeah. of... Uh, Financing terms, market trends, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, I, things you've noticed. I, yeah, I think the biggest, um, I mean, the biggest difference is obviously that there aren't as uniform trends. You know, frankly, it's a lot more varied here um, in terms of uh, the types of companies, in terms of the types of investors, in terms of the forms of deals. You know, Silicon Valley has kind of gotten to a point where, you know, it's just the deal. I mean, you know, this is the same template that everyone uses, and there's like, six levers that people pull, uh, uh, people pull, and then everything follows the same template. Um, you know, and, and that's because you have a really robust environment. You know, there's no worry about that next round of financing not being there. Um, you know, sort of the, the transition from C to A to B to mezzanine to IPO is just all laid out. And if you hit your milestones, then the rest of that's gonna be in place. And frankly, it's important that it all sort of be right along the same pathway so that everyone's familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here you don't have that as well developed an ecosystem. So, you know, frankly, investors need to be a little bit more cautious about, um, you know, about how they invest. They need some more protections for, um, you know, being able to manage sort of a longer funding cycle sometimes. You know, what if that next round of financing doesn't come through? The, um, you know, the exit opportunities aren't always as robust here. So sometimes you need a little bit more 
you know, exit terms, you know, maybe you need a redemption right, maybe you need a for sale provision. Um, and, uh, and then the other trend that's different here is the companies are, are for the most part a lot earlier stage. Um, you know, or <laughs> I should say they are either earlier stage or they are a manufacturing company that's looking to raise $50 million via a, a structured note. Mm -hmm. You know, because they just need to go out and, and go leverage. So, um, you know, there's not a whole lot in between that range at this point. So, that's, those are probably the biggest differences I've seen. Almost short on time, so open it to questions. I think uh, these are the other resources we mentioned. Again, hit us up if you want a list of these, or again, if we can help. Sort of, if you're interested in learning more about specific terms and, and sort of ins and outs of those. But otherwise, I'll open up to questions if there are any. We're, we're uh, Almost right on time. Um, starting to see more convertible notes. Uh, what's your take on that? Do you We're traditional investors. We like to know what we're buying. So we like we much prefer equity deals and rarely do uh, any sort of convertible note. Um, I think I think in the past the whole idea was convertible notes are so much easier just to get the deal done, especially at the seed stage, you don't have to pay you know, the lawyer so much money to get a deal done to buy equity. But now with the seed documents and all the templates, I think that argument's kind of passe. And certainly now with notes, a lot of times there's a valuation cap anyway. So you're already kind of setting what the value of the company is too. So you know, getting rid of the legal costs and then you know, not having to actually value the company, I think those two arguments are now gone. But for us, at least, it makes a lot more sense just to do an equity deal. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of convertible notes for all the reasons Michael just said. I do think there is a time and place for them if it's, um, you know, if it is a very, very friendly deal. Let's say it's mm -hmm. friends and family kind of round, and you don't want to get into a valuation discussion with your uncle um, or your best friend from high school. You know, convertible notes are kind of nice in that respect, and that you can, you know, totally punt on the valuation discussion. Um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind with convertible notes is that at some point they have to convert. And normally the way most of them are structured is it's got, um, you know, they say we'll convert into the next sort of equity financing round. And normally there's like a discount, like 20%. Um, and so if it's going to be this long 18, 24 month cycle and you're looking at your investor, which, which again, is going to be that period that you're going to overcome all of these milestones in the next 6, 12, 18 months. And the investor is sitting there saying, okay, for taking this massive amount of risk, because in all likelihood I'm never going to get paid back, I get 20% return on my investment. Um, you know, that's not a great deal for them. Now, shift that to the other situation, which is, okay, I'm in discussions with these six VC companies. Um, you know, they're going to put in $1 million, but I need $150,000 to get me between now and the next two months so that I can make payroll. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. Maybe that's a, a more appropriate situation for it. You know you're not going to dictate terms against the million or two that's getting ready to come in. You're probably pretty confident that um, you know, the people that he's talking to are going to negotiate terms that are going to be something that you're happy with. And then you get a 20% return for you know, taking on that two months of risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. But otherwise, yeah, that's fair. otherwise it's, yeah, it's quick, cheap, and standard standardized enough that I just go with the Series C uh, preferred equity round. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, after the term has been signed and uh, the money's been wired and everybody's happy and everything's going really well, what would you say from your perspective are the first things that sort of change with the team or, or the business after that's all happened? When you miss your first... What kind of change with the dynamic that you guys have seen? What the changes? Mm -hmm. They have money in the relationships. Now there's money, now there's VC involved, and what typically changes? I think for us, a lot of times, just managing expectations. And so during, you know, before everything signed, just being very crisp and clear on what the expectations are. What's the capital being used for? What are the milestones? What kind of penetration are you going to get in the market? And just being, you know, really on the same page in that regard. Because the last thing you want to do is, okay, we're funded, you know, 1,000 customers next month. We'll, now we only plan for a hundred. That's a big issue. If you were both shooting for a thousand and you got a hundred, and you can you know work through why you only got a hundred, that's a much different discussion and just really different expectations. Um, and then I think it's that, and then just setting up 
what the reporting cycle and what the communication cycle is going to be, just to be very clear, to make sure that you know, your investors getting the information they need to feel comfortable of how the investment's going, but making sure it's not so burdensome on the, uh, on, the on the entrepreneurs. The last thing you want them doing is spending you know, 20 hours yeah. a week <laughs> generating yeah. reports. You know, it's, it's what, what metrics do you look at and how can they fit into the reporting cycle um, to, keep us, to keep us informed? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, normally, you know, having seen sort of companies before and after a lot, I mean, wh what happens is, is the companies shift into high gear. I mean, you know, for the most part, the three months beforehand, their entire life has been planning, 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 pitching, 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 and you finally actually get the check. And now on Monday, you're supposed to show up and actually start doing all of the stuff you've been talking about doing for six, 12 months. And you have the cash in the bank to do it. And you have someone coming into your office in four weeks that's gonna say, all right, you said you were gonna do this, this, and this. Where is it? What's the status? How come it didn't work? Um, and so, the, I mean, it really just accelerates it. And sometimes that puts strain on the team, you know, where uh, the team that you had before that may have been, you know, really good at sort of the initial phases and it was all nice and, and fine when you were, you know, showing up and having fun. But now that, you know, now that you've kicked it up a notch and now that you're really saying, no, I need this delivered on this date, no excuses, because we need to, we need to hit these results. Um, you know, sometimes it can lead to tensions and, you know, a lot of times you do see management shifting, sometimes turnover, um, you know, within the first six months after financing or uh, financing. Some teams respond fantastic. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, this is everything that you've been asking for for six months and you're just ecstatic to have it. You're excited to be able to actually go out and build. Um, and then sometimes that exposes cracks in the system. And sometimes both, usually both. Um, say your new investor comes in day one, but it takes you know, six months to close the round. Do you think everyone should have the same terms hmm. with that round? Especially in how to start, where there's been so much growth with the next month? That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it Technically, no, right? Because you know your financing has gotten further down the path, and, and there's less risk for the next investor. But that's just you're just in a tough spot, right? Because you're, you're probably not going to rewrite all the new deal docs. You know, the most frustrating part there is your concern that instead of the entrepreneur, you know, deploying your capital to build a business, they're still out giving pitches for six months. Yeah. Um, well, and, and it creates an interesting dynamic if you have investors who have are differently situated. Um, if you say, you know, it's always going to be you're going to give the kicker to the first money in, right? Um, let's say you give them some warrant coverage for saying, hey, thanks for leading this around. And there's a lot of arguments out there to say that they're, that it's justified and that they should have it and that it's, you know, valuable because they're taking the biggest risk. But your next, your next investor is either kind of, when they find out about it, they're going to want it. Mm -hmm. um, or when they find out about it and they didn't get it, they're going to be really, really angry at you. And again, then you're, you've just sort of disrupted this investor dynamic. So it's a tough thing to pull off. Um, although there, it is a, a topic that is hotly debated um, uh, out there, so. Where do you guys draw the line when you have an early stage company um, and they're considering looking for VC money, but you know, where's the line where maybe you tell them, hey, look, you need to gut it out and bootstrap it maybe get some friends and family money because, you know, one, it's not worth your time to go, you know, chase these seeds, or two, you know, maybe you're better off waiting, maybe, uh, you know, you get this thing farther down the road, you're going to get a better valuation, but I mean, what's a, what's a good advice to an early stage company about where that line is? I think for us, it really gets around the, the, the customer validation piece, where if, if you've eliminated the technical risk and that you've actually built the prototype and it works, that's really going to help your valuation and get VCs excited. And then the next piece is the customer validation. So if you have somebody that's you know independent, it's not your your buddy or you know your dad's buddy that, that bought it from you. But if you've got real customers that you've shown that you can go out and sell this, and we can talk to those customers, and you know they're saying we love it. This is the problem we're solving. We're telling all of our friends. That's when you start getting attractive to companies. But if it's you know on the napkin or it's not quite completed, 
it's got an awesome front end, but there's no back end database to it. That's when you say, hey, you know, talk to grandma, maybe you can get 20K to hire the developer to figure it out. Because you're just, you're gonna get a really rotten validation. And it's gonna be really hard to raise money if you don't have a product and a customer. Yeah. The, the other thing I'll tell um, you know, clients from the company side when they're coming through, I mean, to some extent, wait till the last possible mo moment to raise money. Um, we've seen, you know, especially the angels, you've seen people come in and they're like, okay, great, I've been heads down, I've built my product, it finally works. Um, I've got, you know, one lead customer and, uh, you know, I want to raise $500,000 so that I can, um, you know, whatever it is they're going to go do. And it turns out that their business model is, um, you know, either enterprise-based or uh, there's some really low-hanging fruit where they can go get a lot more customers by just picking up the phone and, and hoofing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I normally, my advice to the companies is, look, you know, if you don't need that money and can just spend your time going and getting another 10,000 customers or $10,000 or, you know, whatever it is, you know, where, where you don't have to have that money to go out and move your business to the next level, then go out and go do it because you're just going to be that much more valuable when you actually do raise money. And so wait till you absolutely positively have to have the, um, the cash because look, you just, you're on the phone every single day for 18 hours a day and you have maxed out your personal capacity and have to hire a that next sales rep and you need cash to go do it mm -hmm. you know wait That's wait fair. till that moment we've gone a little over so i think yeah. we'll, we'll call it quits we'll sit up here for a minute if you have other questions um, again i should have brought the schedule we do this uh twice a month then we'll know when the next one is the day yeah, well, go to our website or, 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 or call our handle. Yeah. Woo! That's work. That's work. You can tell all, all of our secrets. Yeah. Make it clear. Well done. Hi. Thank you.